but I guess we can just approve them and go forward. I didn't want to embarrass everybody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Moving on to consent items. Item 2A, Steve Fiore. What you got for us, Steve? Uh, well, this morning I have one change order to report. Uh, this is on the Quincy Intertie Improvements Project. This project was located out at the Quincy Reservoir adjacent to the Pros Dog Park. A little background on the project because this is a, a great project for the utility. It took several small and deep valve vaults we had spread out around uh, the Quincy Reservoir. And these vaults were uh, kind of hazardous to enter. They were confined space uh, required entries. Uh, very deep. And what we did is we took these vaults and we combined them into a, what we call it the super vault, a big two story structure. Uh, doesn't require uh, any confined space entry. It provided efficiencies and uh, some more options for the utility to be able to move water between different water sources and the different plants and reservoirs. So it was a, a great project, in, in my opinion. Uh, so this is the last change order to report on the projects done. And like a lot of new projects that especially ones that take kind of a lot of real estate up, um, we had some tweaking to do at the end. And in this case, uh, the majority of the money uh, went to stormwater improvements. We had a pretty big storm in October of last year, and we just found some areas around the site that we're vulnerable to stormwater uh, drainage and we had some erosion and all that. So some money was put into improving the protection of the site with some stormwater improvements. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the site is located near the pros dog park out there and the dogs and their owners were a little interested in the new structure out there and all that. So we added some additional security fencing around the site just to you know, protect the dogs and their owners uh, from getting too close to our facility. There are some pretty steep slopes and some some little areas that we just wanted to keep people away from so they wouldn't trip and fall. Um, and then really there were th three existing valves that are around this new structure uh, that we modified a little bit, pro provided some additional improvements on them so that the new vault structure and these existing valves would uh, sync up and, and operate a little bit better together, but uh, that was really about it. The good thing is that uh, the overall change orders for this project were under 5%, which is our goal for any given project. So, um, yeah, I think really one of our, our, you know, really good projects over the last couple of years um, provide a lot of improvements and efficiencies. And uh, again, we brought it in under the change order budget. So pretty happy. Any questions I can answer? Congratulations on being under budget. Uh, questions from council members? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you. Moving on, John Murphy, water resource project manager, water supply update. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, we are, uh, the report was um, captured the full month of February. So the data in there is just to the end of February. And at that point, we were at 53% of storage. Um, on page seven, um, there's a couple graphs. One is the uh, five-year system storage. Um, and, and you can see a couple bumps in that, uh, in this year's storage trend. That's a, that's a lease of water that we're, we're getting from uh, Pueblo Board of Water Works. Those were the first two installments. Um, we got a, third one this month. Um, so that's helping a little bit. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is uh, the snow graphs that are in there um, as of the end of February. Um, we've gotten a little bit of a bump in some of those uh, basins in the last couple of weeks. So right now, um, I just ran them this morning. So it's South Platte Basin, for the snow tell sites that are pertinent to our watershed area um, and for our yield, the South Platte Basin is now at 83% and the Arkansas Basin is at 90% and the Colorado Basin is at 112% for our particular snow tell sites of interest there. So 
Um, that's nice to see. Hopefully that trend will continue. I know there's, Greg mentioned, there's some snow expected in the mountains um, um, tonight. So um, any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, council members, go ahead, please. Uh, yes. Uh, council Steve, member Coombs. Or council member Sundberg, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my question, I heard this morning that there is some rain on snow happening up in the high country, resulting in some faster melting than we expected. Um, do we know how that may impact our reservoirs, um, if at all? I know they're mostly concerned about flooding, um, but I'm wondering if there's also um, any impact to our reservoirs from that. Um, I hadn't heard that. Um, at least as far as it's reflected in the snowpack graphs, um, I'm not seeing a reduction um, in the in the in the overall snowpack as a result of whatever rain may be happening. I'm not sure where that where that's occurring. But yeah, of course, if it if it does rain significantly and we're warmer than you would expect, that that melt to start in the snowpack would would be reduced a little bit this time of year. We don't have any water rights that are in priority, so um, uh, it doesn't really benefit us if if the streams start to fill up right now. Um, we won't have water rights kick on until April. So, sorry, as a follow up, <laughs> if there, so if a lot of melting happened now, could that potentially negatively impact? us in terms of reduction of snowpack before our roads are called it yes yes that that would um there's such a dynamic uh question um it i mean there's a potential the 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 water rights that are calling right now are downstream on the lower south plat for um large irrigation reservoirs and so I suppose if there's an increased stream flow now because of some um, early snow melt, that there's a potential that those reservoirs may fill up a little bit better and potentially could impact the call in our favor later on. Um, but that's that's you know speculation, and um, it would certainly depend on how much water was coming down. I'm not seeing it in the stream flow right now. I mean the the water coming out of Chatfield um, is regulated by the state in Denver is very low. So I'm not seeing an increase in stream flow resulting from uh, whatever rain may be happening up there right now. We are seeing, it's interesting, there, this, the moisture content of the snow is a little higher this year um in in a few areas and that might be a result of some of the rain on snow is driving the moisture content up which would be additionally beneficial to us again if it starts running off sooner um that could hurt us in some ways from a reduced snowpack perspective but potentially benefit us in other ways like john mentioned so it, that that's a really good question kind of hard to to give a definitive answer. Yeah. I guess best case scenario would be rain or snow. If the snow, if the water content in the snowpack increases and then it stays cold, then it's still captured up there. And then, then we'll see that when the runoff happens. Great. Any further questions? Uh, I have a, a question regarding reservoir storage. I haven't been out to the Aurora Reservoir for quite some time or Quincy Reservoir. Visually, just looking at those reservoirs, will we see them down to the to the point where there is concern? Aurora Reservoir is pretty full right now, and, and that's just a result of operationally us moving water, you know, down from the upper reservoir systems into Aurora. Um, our goal is always to have Aurora Reservoir full by April 1st around that time frame and so um the overall system content stays the same as just we're moving it down to the city where it's you know here for so, us yeah and historic we do that for for 
kind of risk to the system operations, we always keep Aurora Reservoir and Quincy Reservoir as full as we can. So you're not likely gonna see the impacts in those. Where you'll see the impacts is if, you, if we were to go up to Spinney Mountain Reservoir right now, um, or Homestake Reservoir, Spinney especially, you will see dramatically lower water levels in Spinney Mountain Reservoir. Um, home stake is lower as well um, for a couple of other good reasons. But I, I will tell you, Councilman Sundberg, I've debated should we keep some of it up high just so the public doesn't have the artificial impression that, hey, we're great because Aurora and Quincy are full. But it would create additional risk in our system um, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. Thank you. I asked because we have a couple of doubting Thomases on our city council. Seems like. We do, and they probably drive out to Aurora Reservoir and say, it's full. You guys aren't telling us the truth. We need to drag them up to Spinney is what we need to do. <laughs> I see. I see. Hopefully, they'll take part in the water tour as well if they haven't. I look forward to that yeah. myself. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, switching items from three to four uh, in order here, reverse. Uh, Sarah Young, large industrial water users criteria. Yeah, great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And Greg, I, I should have probably given you a heads up if you can. Um, please let me share um, my screen. That would be great. Oh, there it goes. Give me a second here. Um, okay, great. Let me. Oops. All right. Oh, let's see what's happening. So, are you guys seeing the word document with the table up? Is that yes. Yes. showing? Yep. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you again. So, um, as you know, we are constantly looking for ways to um, make sure that our water use is sustainable and that we can plan for all the growth that we're expecting. Uh, one of the areas that we've been focusing on recently are large industrial customers. Um, as you know, we did have a Niagara facility. Oh, I think we lost you, Sarah. Or I lost you, someone. It looks like I lost everyone but you, Chair Sunberg. It's just the two of us here. Oh, I no, I guys. <laughs> I'm still here. I lost. I'm Sarah. still here too, but I can't hear. I Sarah. lost Sarah as well. Sarah may need to start over. Internet mic on down. I don't see Sarah or Marshall or Greg, so I wonder if something happened at City Hall. Oh wait, now I see Greg. There, they're back. Right. Okay. Hello. Can you, did our network go down here? It, yeah. yeah it lost it. There. It, might need it must have. Yeah. Okay, so we're back. <laughs> um, all right, great. So um, not sure where that got open. Oh, yeah, now I'm getting the network issue um, situation. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my video off and see if that, if I can figure out how to do that and see how that might be helpful for our network connection. Um, okay, so in general, looking for, so I talked a little bit about um, Niagara, maybe is where that stopped, and um, trying to find a um, way for us to just make sure that the customers that are coming into the city um, are in line with kind of the water use and sustainability that we need in order to, to provide future water supply. So what we developed is a matrix. We, we get a lot of questions from AADC about different customers coming in and lately have gotten a lot of questions about very large water users that do not return wastewater flow back to the system, which as you know, is really important for us to be able to recapture. So, um, so the table that um, I believe I'm still showing here, um, shows you basically what we've come up with. So um, 
one of the ways that we're looking at water use is on a per acre water basis. And, and the reason we do that is that's how we do planning for our overall master plan um, is we, we take an amount of water per acre and that's what we calculate for our future demands depending on land use. Um, so what you'll see on the left side of this table is, um, is 600 gallons uh, per day per acre up to 3,500 gallons per day per acre. When we're calculating water use for the system for industrial areas, we actually only go up to about 2,000 gallons per day per acre, which we're going to have to revisit. Um, but the reason that this table goes up to 3,500 is we also looked at data for all water uh, or all water user types. And multifamily um, average is about that 3,500 gallons per day per acre. And so it didn't feel appropriate to limit industrial less than what we're limiting um, or what we're seeing from multifamily uses on a per acre basis. So that was kind of how the table evolved. And, and then across the top, what you'll see are percentages of basically wastewater flow back into the system that we're able to recapture. So we don't have to develop new water rights in the instance of a, a situation like Niagara where the water leaves the system. Um, the majority of our customers are up in this green area and some of kind of these early uh, yellow areas in terms of water use and, and really um, high on the recoverable percentages. Um, what we want to do is when there are customers that come in with a really high water use, um, and in cases where they're taking the water out of the system, we're suggesting that those should not be allowed in our system because it really impacts our sustainability. But there is um, an area where the water use is getting high and the recoverable use is also getting higher where we wanna start having conversations with those uh, customers. The first conversation that we have is what can you do from a water conservation perspective to bring yourself into an area that's allowed by the city. Um, so those are the initial conversations we have. However, if, um, if, if there is somebody that's starting to get into kind of this lighter red color, um, we do also want to have a conversations with them to understand what the positive impacts to the city are for allowing that water supply. So some of the criteria that we have um, established in conjunction with the Aurora Economic Development Council, as well as our planning team, um, is, is, is up here where we have, okay, how many employees are being brought to the city with this customer? How many high value jobs are included in, in that customer use? Uh, what is the capital investment into the city? Um, is there a diversity in the employer base? Um, is this a nationally recognized um, company that helps kind of put Aurora on the map? Um, and then also, is this a customer that supports an existing employment center? So those are some of the initial uh, criteria that we put together where we may want to make a decision to allow a higher water use or a, um, a higher kind of non-recoverable use um, because the benefits are, are worth it. Um, so when though that information, so what we've asked for from the from AEDC is when a customer comes into the space, again, we'll have a conversation to say what water conservation measures can you put in place to bring you into the yellow, green, or orange. Um, but if they can't get there, then basically a format that shows here's the location, here's how this um, customer impacts all those criteria that I just ran through. Um, we also are very interested about. Um, excuse me, about the water quality, because we are going to be recapturing and reusing that water. We want to be really careful with, with what's getting put into that water. Um, but then, um, and then, and then that criteria will be put together kind of a, a one or two page document. That's a summary of, of, of what this customer, um, uh, the makeup of the customer and their requirements are. And then that would be a conversation with, um, with, uh, the water department and upper up, upper city management to make that decision. Um, is, is, are the trade offs worth it? Is that increased water supply worth all the benefits that they'd be bringing to the city? Uh, so the hope is that we will uh, move this forward into um, a policy. Um, uh, policy uh, portion of our criteria manual. Um, and so that was the hope today is to bring it uh, to you all for kind of considerations and feedback.
Great. Thank you, Sarah. Questions? Yes, uh, yes. yes Councilman Bergen. Um, I like this. Um, it is very similar to I'm on the E470 board and we have a very similar type of chart with the green, yellow, red on what projects have a nexus to E470. So I like I like this because I think for decision making, um, it's very um, you know, it, it lays out clearly um, the criteria. Um, so I, I guess could you go back to the the criteria that we use in yeah. Um, and that, you know, we get a lot of questions from our constituents about, you know, why are we going into um, the different tiers? Why do we have the drought so forth? So uh, we're getting a lot of those right now in terms of why are you, um, you know, why are you considering um, adding um, annexations, that type of thing. So same, same thought on companies. Um, I mean, do you weight these the criteria? Because obviously it goes in that box, the use is in the red, but you said further evaluation. And I guess I, if it's in the dark or in the red, I think that's still problematic. Um, so are these weighted at all? That's a great question. And, and currently they aren't. Um, what I imagine is going to happen as we start utilizing this system, that 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 this will get more refined in terms of how these different things are kind of understood and what value is put in each one of these different categories. Um, and and at this point, so to answer your question at this point, no, but I would anticipate that it evolves certainly. Okay. All right. Thank now you. The first thing we're going to try to do is push them out of the red, get them into the orange or or yellow or green with efficiencies or landscape designs or anything we can to drive their water use down. That's our first step. And then to very good question, when we end up in the red, the dark red is just going to be not allowed. The more bright red um, will be conversations that will have to evolve if we can't get them pushed into the orange or the yellow. Um, we're going to have to figure that out. And does waiting evolve? This is a bit of a new concept. We haven't applied this yet, so it will probably evolve and refine a little bit as we go along. And if I might, one more, please. Sorry. Um, just so, are you evaluating current users as well as potential in this scenario? Yeah, this is only for uh, new users coming into the system. Okay. We are with current users evaluating um, current users not using this table, but kind of in a, we're identifying the high water users and we're having conversations with them about how to lower their water use. So for example, we met with Amazon yesterday. Um, they're not an extremely high water user, but they are a huge customer. They have a ton of non-functional turf. So we met with them and specifically discussed the non-functional turf and how we might be able to work with them in converting it and lowering, lowering their water uses. So we're having the conversations and we're identifying those high water use customers, but not, not necessarily in the context of this matrix. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank Councilmember Coombs? Yes, um, Marshall addressed a lot of what I had questions about in terms of kind of offsetting water uses through landscaping. Um, I guess the other thing I'm wondering about is, can we require kind of other sustainability measures, not only with respect to water, but also just other kind of environmentally protective um, measures from these entities? Um, you know, part of our water issues are related to climate change. So for example, any other, um, you know, greenhouse gas reduction or other climate related um, just measures that they would put in place to kind of help address the fact that they are having a high impact um, environmentally as well by having a high impact with respect to water. Yeah, that's also a really good, good point. Um, we do have in our comprehensive plan kind of the sustainability section that focuses on 
not just water, but also gets into energy use, carbon emissions, kind of the, the overall environmental impacts. So we've prioritized, well, we've identified the need to prioritize in those spaces. Water, as is maybe not uncommon, is, is out in front a little bit in establishing actual criteria. Um, but what we can do, we are moving forward with the city's um, kind of strategic planning process right now that ties to the comprehensive plan goals and priorities. And so we will definitely flag that and look for opportunities. Nothing like that exists exactly yet, but I do think that's a good point. We should be able to identify other ways to incorporate um, more of those criteria into development moving forward. Thank you. So uh, any, anything else from uh, council members? Okay. So Niagara would be in the deep red here, I assume. It would be in the deep red, yes. Deep red, okay. And what are some other users of water industrially that don't allow it to be recaptured? So one of the other ones that actually um, lands in the red or deep red, depending on, is a concrete batch plant is one of the other users. Um, there's- um, Is that Martin Marietta, perhaps? Um, you know, I just looked at the meter data and the, and the so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure in the customer number. Oh, but okay. Right but I but concrete batch plants as an example, right, is a manufacturing process where it's a high water use and and leaves the system. And those have been a number of the questions that we've got that we don't always get told what the exact use is um, for new customers coming into the city um, when it's still um, kind of being handled just by AEDC, uh, but a lot of manufacturing specific uses. We've got, you know, canning companies, food canning, beverages, um, those types of things have certainly uh, been in that space. Yeah, beverage companies would definitely be up in that space, and and we've dealt with some of those recently. They land in the in the or would land in the deep deep red, and food processing. Sarah identified canning activities, so like vegetable or or fruit canning processes also end up in the um, really high non recoverable space. I see. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I have, sorry, oh, one more please, question oh, that came up. Council Thank you. Yeah. Um, so where on this would fracking fall? I know that we don't want them to be bringing in water from outside in general, um, if they're otherwise permitted to operate, but in terms of just the volumetric use and how much of the water is non-recoverable. And then also you mentioned water quality. So even if it's recoverable, um, to what extent are there water quality issues with the water that is recovered with fracking? That's a great question. And I have not done that uh, math, but I will, and we'll let you know. Great, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And moving on to Sherry, item number three, joint wet weather. Colorado Discharge Permit Activities Intergovernmental Agreement. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Sherry Skidjari. Um, I think I've met most of you. I'm the Environmental Services Manager, and uh, we have this agreement with Mile High Flood District that um, they help Denver and Lakewood and Aurora with our municipal separate storm sewer, or you've maybe heard MS4 because who wants to say that big giant mouthful of words? Um, so our MS4 permit that's through the state, we all, um, the three of us are phase one permittees and that carries with it some requirements that by joining together, we can do a better job of looking at data and just um, collaborating a little bit more through this, um, especially the wet weather, uh, stormwater runoff monitoring. So, um, for instance, if there's a rainstorm, they go to these stations and they will collect samples, analyze them, and then they have historical data to be able to trend that and uh, see what we're what we can learn from that. Um, so that this is that agreement. Um, the agreement, the Aurora pays twenty nine thousand dollars for the participation in this group, 
and we're asking for you to be able to move this on to a council meeting for approval and signature. Any questions, concerns from council members? So that we can move it forward, it looks like. Item right. moved forward. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Item number five, Rich with a water storage project update. Good morning, everybody. Um, appreciate the, the time to come and give a, a storage update. It's been a few years uh, since uh, since we've done this. And uh, so we're going to go over um, just a few of the projects we've been working on uh, on the storage front uh, within the system. So I think Greg is going to start uh, the PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, Greg. So in terms of the agenda, um, <clears throat> uh, a little bit of a system overview, uh, talk a little bit. Uh, you already I saw the uh, water supply update from John, so some of that will be a little repetitive. Um, and then we'll start in the mountains and work our way towards uh, towards towards the city. So, yeah, Greg. Um, so just kind of a system overview. Again, 50% uh, of our water comes from the South Platte Basin, 25% uh, from the Arkansas, 25% from, from the Colorado. Uh, we have a few animations here um, in the next steps uh, to kind of highlight where some of the locations are. So Wild Horse Reservoir uh, and Box Creek are the first two on the agenda. Wild Horse is uh, located in the South Platte Basin. Um, below the uh, Otero pipeline and above Spinning Mountain Reservoir. So off channel reservoir uh, that we've been um, uh, working on since about 2011. Um, Box Creek Basin uh, or Box Creek uh, Reservoir is up in the Arkansas Basin and it is in between uh, Turquoise uh, Lake and Twin Lakes um, just adjacent to, to the Arkansas River. <clears throat> um, the recovery of yield project, um, uh, site is uh, located down in um, lower Arkansas Valley near Rocky Ford, uh, and that's to recover uh, flows that um, are being released out of Pueblo. And then we'll move up into the city, um, talk about uh, gravel pits up on the north campus uh, associated with Prairie Waters, and then talk about uh, aquifer storage and recovery, uh, as well as um, uh, future uh, potential east reservoir uh, east of uh, uh, east of Aurora. So, go ahead, Greg. <clears throat> so um, this graph might look a little bit different than uh, what may be in your packet. We updated this this morning with uh, some new uh, new data as it came in. So and we truncated it down to, to back down to 2002 to present. So uh, this just shows our system capacity uh, from 2002 to now as well as kind of where our water levels uh, currently sit. So you can see so the 2002 drought on the left-hand side of the graph, uh, what that did to our storage levels uh, and, and the recovery post-drought. Uh, post um, in terms of system capacity there, the heavy black line on the top, uh, you can see where we've taken um, uh, some uh, facilities offline, home stake reservoir for maintenance, those kind of things. Um, and then the right-hand side of the graph, uh, you can kind of see the trend that we're in. Um, and John talked a little bit about it, uh, but in terms of uh, the, those peak uh, storage um, numbers after after runoffs occurred, uh, and and you can kind of see the trend that we're that we're moving towards uh, at the moment in terms of uh, storage levels. So. Um, similar graph, probably in the water supply update. Um, Again, just current storage levels around 83,000 acre feet. Uh, Marshall was talking a, a little bit about Spinney earlier. Uh, so that's kind of the visual uh, representation of, of where Spinney's at. And of course, Aurora Res is, uh, is much more uh, full uh, uh, in terms of its capacity. So uh, again, we're staging water where it needs to be uh, in, in anticipation for, for the season. So. Um, I'll jump into Wild Horse here uh, as part of the update again. I zoomed in a little bit, and where you can see its uh, its location uh, in terms of uh, the South Platte and, and Spinney Mountain. <clears throat> so um, I, I believe uh, members of the committee have been uh, back up to the site um, a couple of years ago. Um, originally, the site started off as a thirty-two thousand acre foot uh, reservoir. Um, and upon further investigation, we determined that the uh, topography, topography could support 
uh, a larger reservoir up to 96,000. And so uh, around 2016 through 2018, we were investigating that. Um, as you guys know, uh, the, the geology in South Park is, is quite complex. And as we be, uh, continued geotechnical investigations, we had discovered that um, the southern end of the site due to you know, ancient seabeds and folding and faulting that have occurred over geologic time, um, the geology on the southern end, the soils uh, and, and the basement rock um, were not as good for dam foundation and for water storage. Um, and so we began to investigate, well, how can we configure uh, the reservoir to get the maximum amount of storage on the best uh, quality basement rock that we could um, that was feasible. Um, and so you see a difference here uh, based off of uh, work that we've done in the last couple of years where we've changed uh, the footprint of the dam. So we've on that western side, we've swung that dam over to kind of cut off uh, the, the south end and we've raised uh, we've raised the dams uh, as well. So the figure on the left, uh, the storage capacity right there was around 96,000 acre feet and storage on the right is 93,000 acre feet. So we raised the dams, um, uh, but we kind of uh, cut off that southern end, which was more shallow anyway. Um, and, and so we've got a very similar uh, potential capacity there. Um, the um, surface area actually uh, is smaller um, under the current configuration. Um, so about 700 acres difference or so. So uh, anyways, um, uh, actually a better footprint in terms of water quality, evaporation, um, but uh, slightly different than what we had been planning. Okay. So just to kind of put numbers to it, um, I'm, an, I'm an engineer, so you're going to get numbers from me today um, to look at the, the difference in, in terms of the footprint. Again, uh, 92, 93,000 acre feet is, is what, we're, what we're expecting. Uh, the perimeter is uh, slightly different. Um, and you can see the difference in the elevation um, of the dams. Uh, we've added um, um, a couple more uh, slightly different dams uh, because of the change of footprint. They kind of go in different locations. Uh, we moved the location of the main dam up the canyon a little bit uh, just to give us more um, freeboard space uh, up the canyon. So uh, slightly different. Um, um, the lengths of the dams are are shorter, but the uh, overall height is going to be larger. So. so, in terms of the layout, uh, kind of backing uh, out from the from the map a little bit, uh, on the southern end of the site, the Otero pipeline, um, we've moved intake a little bit further to the east uh, to basically align with the current county road. Uh, the topography there is a little bit better. Uh, for the hydraulics of that pipeline, given the new the new footprint, um, and then we're investigating on the downstream side um, the pipeline outlet uh, back to Spinney Mountain Reservoir. So water to come in on the south side from Otero, come through the reservoir, we will be released uh, back out to Spinney, uh, back out to Spinney Reservoir. We currently take our water uh, right now uh, into Spinney Mountain Reservoir. Um, it comes through, um, uh, gets discharged out of the Otero pipeline, comes through a six mile open channel. Um, and so there are some operational um, uh, benefits to uh, moving water through the pipeline uh, through Wild Horse in the future. Um, freezing is the biggest issue there that we've got up there and, and open channel requires a lot more maintenance than a, than a pipeline does. So there's some benefits uh, to, to moving our water through, uh, through, through the pipeline. Okay, Greg. So, in terms of the uh, what's what's kind of coming up next uh, for uh, for Wild Horse and the work plan, there's been a few things that have already come through council uh, this year in terms of permitting. Um, uh, but uh, with the new footprint, uh, some of the lands that we need have changed, uh, and so we're um, going to be looking at uh, acquiring those lands that are needed uh, outside of the outside of the footprint uh, current footprint. Um, we are uh, also gearing up for additional geotechnical investigations this year. Uh, we plan to drill about 25 to 27,000 linear feet of, uh, of borings. Uh, so real um, intense um, geotechnical investigation uh, to, uh, to really better understand uh, the foundations up there and move 
from the feasibility level to the 30% design level uh, for, for the reservoir. Um, uh, communications and messaging. Um, so we, uh, Greg has, has been putting together kind of our communications plan, um, identifying stakeho uh, stakeholders uh, that we've already kind of started some engagement with. Um, and so we'll be doing a lot more communications uh, with uh, the conservancy districts, uh, the county, um, and uh, probably local landowners uh, up there as, as the project moves forward. So much more, um, messaging and communications going on well within the project. Um, on the permitting side, we've made a lot of headway this year. Uh, we um, secured a uh, collection agreement with the BLM. The BLM is the Bureau of Land Management is the lead federal agency uh, that we have to permit this project through. They hold property within the footprint and so we have to get a right of way uh, from them to develop the site. Um, and so uh, our first step with them is was was developing that collection agreement, which we took to council earlier this or, um, late last year. Um, that allows us to uh, fund the staff at the at the BLM uh, to work on our project. Uh, recently, we had the memorandum of understanding come through, uh, which basically outlined our responsibilities and and the BLM's responsibilities for the permitting moving forward also allows us to hire uh, the third party consultant who will actually author the environmental document, the EIS uh, document. And so um, that MOU has been done and we are working on the RFP process now uh, to uh, get that consultant hired. So under the current regulations, Aurora is allowed to hire that third party. Uh, we've worked um, with, with the BLM to develop that scope of work. Uh, so that's probably the next document that council is going to see um, in terms of permitting is is that RFP uh, and the selection for that um, uh, consultant. So uh, that's a huge, uh, huge step uh, for the project uh, to get that consultant on board, because uh, once uh, they're up to speed, uh, the federal government can initiate the, the official permitting process and we can get underway. Um, we're also concurrently uh, working on some of our raw water modeling. Um, so looking at how uh, wild horse will fit into the system, how we will operate it, uh, how we will use it to move water around uh, within, within the system um, and develop the scenarios that we need to give to the third party to, uh, to investigate as part of the environmental document. Um, the uh, design of the Otero uh, tap, so, um, I mentioned that we moved the location a little bit uh, to the east uh, where we're going to take water off the Otero pipeline. So uh, that's something that we can go ahead and start um, is looking how we're going to make that connection to, to that pipeline. And then uh, kind of in, in, in there with modeling, looking into and flow out flow rates. Uh, again, we're trying to kind of size some of the infrastructure uh, and that gets into the operations. Um, you know, are we going to, uh, you know, are we going to take longer to move water? Are we going to move water in, in uh, larger larger slugs? And so that's going to help us uh, identify uh, the sizing of, of the infrastructure that we're going to need moving forward. So. Um, the next project uh, that we're going to look at um, is going to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, um, land acquisition, I'm sorry. Um, so here's a, a map of the footprint. Um, the light pink that's uh, that's shown there is currently what the Aurora holds. You can see the f uh, outline of of the reservoir. Um, <clears throat> the dark purple is going to be uh, private land holdings uh, within the area. Uh, the green is Hartzell Springs Ranch, who is um, uh, the developer uh, up there that we purchased the initial made the initial land purchase from. So. Um, so that shows uh, basically kind of what we have in terms of uh, land under the footprint. So um, the yellow, is, uh, the I'm sorry. Sir, go ahead. I was going to, I would like to ask a question after on, on the land. Okay, that sounds good. Um, the uh, yellow is uh, the um, county road footprint. Um, we will have to likely move uh, county road uh, 53 uh around the reservoir and so we've got a couple of um uh alternatives that we're looking at there so go ahead francois oh thank you um so you know i've been here since we started this project 
and we obviously did a lot of land and acquisition um, based off the old footprint. Then with the new footprint, and now we've changed it a little bit. Um, so I'm kind of surprised that we have this much land acquisition still to accomplish, especially on the northern side. Is that new or was that part, is that an acquisition that just is stalling that we haven't been able to, um, you know, to get an agreement on? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, the original land acquisition uh, was for the 32,000 and then we continued land acquisition for the 96,000 acre foot alternative that had the southern end of the site. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we started in the feasibility um, uh, for uh, what the current configuration is now, we focused on that and, and held off on land acquisition until that feasibility was done. So that way we could you know, get a better idea of what we needed. And so the, particularly on the northern end of the site there, uh, because we raised the dams, uh, the the pool uh, got much uh, more broad and horizontally, and so uh, so the difference between where we were and where we are now is, is we've changed that pool, and so now we need to uh, uh, pick up where we were on the land acquisition side. So we're kind of catching up to the design of this new footprint. But the northern part, the purple. It looks detached from the reservoir. So look, I don't know how much land that is in between. Um, yes. I see a connection on the other side. So do we yeah. really need all that land? We we do. Uh, so what what's within the black area and the and the this connection uh, between the light pink and the darker purple is actually BLM land. Um, so that's a section of uh, of the BLM land that we will need to get a right of way on. Um, is through the permitting process. So the the uh, outer black line is uh, what we've developed as the footprint we need for the reservoir and for a buffer area outside the reservoir. So that'll allow um, for uh, access in the future uh, and create a little bit of distance uh, that Aurora can control between the high water mark and the property boundary. So we've added some additional land there to kind of give us that space. Um, that area on the northern end um, is uh, a little bit steeper. Uh, and so uh, in terms of um, ha having access to that will give us more distance uh, for watershed protection, those kind of things up there as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, Greg. Um, so moving on uh, to, to Box Creek Reservoir, um, again, it's located in the Arkansas Basin uh, between Turquoise Lake and, and Twin Lakes. Um, 25,000 acre foot reservoir, um, we would uh, fill it off of the Arkansas River um, and then discharge back into the Arkansas River. So uh, it would serve the purpose of allowing us to um, facilitate some of our exchanges um, that we operate from the lower Arkansas Basin up uh, up into the upper Arkansas Basin uh, with the goal of uh, uh, getting water into Twin Lakes so we can get it into the Otero pipeline and and move it uh, to to the South Platte Basin here to Aurora. So um, go ahead, Greg. Uh, so the Box Creek uh, project, uh, again, uh, that 25,000 acre foot, um, uh, that's the, the optimal size to avoid the, the Bureau of Reclamations pipeline on the western side um, of the project. So uh, we've been uh, working on it uh, uh, for the last few years, uh, predict, uh, predominantly around some of the wetlands uh, up there, um, the Hayden River uh, parcel, which is uh, just east of the site. Um, we uh, have an approved uh, bank from the Corps of Engineers. Um, the wetland bank will allow us to uh, inundate and remove existing wetlands uh, that we have on the Box Creek site uh, in exchange for other wetlands that we have developed. Um, so it's kind of a trade of wetlands um, as part of the mitigation that we will have to do uh, when we develop the site. Um, we also have a, a determination, a preliminary determination from the Corps engineers on the wetlands. Um, and really what that's, uh, uh, as you've probably watched, there's been a lot of changes to uh, waters of the US um, between the various administrations. And so 
uh, what the uh, preliminary jurisdiction does is basically locks us into um, a determination at the time. Um, and then once we're ready to do the project, we'll move that over to an approved uh, determination and we will know exactly what wetlands we need to mitigate. So moving forward. So that was a major step in terms of getting uh, the core to uh, to agree with our delineation uh, for the wetlands on the site. Um, so now we'll know what we're facing uh, once we uh, once we go to develop the site. Um, a few other things have been going on uh, land related. Um, as you know, we have a, a lease with uh, Titan AU. Uh, the uh, Box Creek uh, and, and the Hollenbeck Ranch was part of historical mining um, um, near the turn of the 1900s. Um, there was a historic dredge up there uh, and they uh, left a lot of gold up there. Uh, their processes weren't uh, as efficient as they are today uh, to extract the gold um, up there. Uh, we entered into mining uh, uh, really as part of our work with the state land board, which is a neighboring landowner. Uh, we need some of their land for uh, the development of Box Creek. And when we engaged with them, they said, well, they want they wanted to get um, some of the mineral value out of their site, but their footprint was uh, fairly small. And so they weren't able to get a, a miner on board that uh, efficiently could could uh, develop the site for them. So we partnered uh, with them to open our lands up for mining to attract a, a mining company that could process both areas. And so uh, uh, to date, uh, we've received about uh, 500,000 in royalty payments. Uh, that money comes back to us and, and goes back into the operating fund. Um, we also have federal land on site, uh, BLM and, uh, and the Forest Service. Uh, we have been in the process of exchanging land uh, through a, a, um, a land exchange process with the Forest Service. Um, and they've had some staffing issues, uh, particularly in the Leadville uh, Ranger District. Uh, we've got some new staff there and uh, we're re-engaging with them. Uh, it's likely that council is gonna see a new collection agreement uh, with them probably in August um, to October timeframe, once their fiscal year rolls over. Uh, they've committed to us to re-engage with us in that process to see if we can trade some lands uh, that we don't need for the project for lands that we do uh, that are more functional for both of us. So um, on the east, very far eastern side of the site, um, the um, near the river, uh, pursuant to some agreements we had with Lake County, uh, we have leased our land uh, to Colorado Parks and Wildlife for open access and fishing. So. Uh, that has been, uh, that lease has been renewed and uh, they're continuing operations uh, uh, there. Um, again, uh, also a lot of stakeholders associated with uh, projects. So we're, we're uh, staff is continuing to stay engaged with uh, Lake County Open Space Initiative. Uh, it's a consortium of environmental groups, uh, the county, uh, federal agencies. So we're still still engaged there with them. Um, we're doing a lot more additional modeling of looking at how uh, Box Creek is going to fit in with, with the system. Um, I already talked about uh, the uh, land exchange um, with, um, with Forest Service. Um, wetlands banking, in terms of on the permitting side, we're really focusing on those wetlands and uh, making sure that we're uh, maintaining the established bank. Um, and then in terms of project management, um, Business is located in the Rocky Ford office, uh, and there's a lot of connections, particularly to the county up there. Uh, we're moving the project management uh, from uh, back down to the Rocky Ford office. Uh, they'll be taking the lead just internally um, on on uh, engaging with the county and, and managing the projects. Um, hey, Rich, be yeah. before you move to the Roy project. I just wanted to clarify a little bit when when Rich talked about the revenues coming in from the mining and he mentioned it comes into the operating uh, budget. That's not exactly um, probably descriptive enough of what happens with that. We actually book that as revenue. Mm -hmm. We don't have the authority to spend that. It gets grouped with all of our other special revenues like water leases, et cetera. And then as we bring our annual budget forward to council, 
council authorizes the expenditure of all of our revenues in the different um, expenditure accounts. So all of the special revenues that we receive from anything, including uh, gold mining, um, we essentially use to subsidize the water rates. It gets put in that water rate bucket and it results in lower uh, needed rate increases to pass on to our customers. So that's how those special revenues, including the, the gold mining revenue, that's how those work. Thank you, Marshall. Appreciate that. Um, so talking about the recovery of yield storage projects. So in uh, 2004, uh, the city uh, entered into um, an IGA with the um, city of Pueblo. Um, as you know, below Pueblo on the Arkansas River, uh, there uh, in, in that reach, uh, there's a kayak course. Um, and um, they wanted water to move through, uh, through the kayak course for recreation. Um, those kind of things. And so, um, because of that, that movement of water, uh, we. Uh, we exchange water from the lower arc uh, up and we, we have to get it into Twin Lakes. And so uh, sometimes that uh, releasing water and the ability to exchange don't don't quite line up. And so um, our water passes through that reach uh, and we have uh, through this through the agreement we have with the uh, city of Pueblo, uh, Pueblo Board of Water Works, uh, Car Springs Utilities and uh, Southeastern Conservancy District, uh, we can recover that water downstream um in storage and then when it's more advantageous uh, exchange it back up so we try to basically trying to recover some of our our yield um uh we've been working on this project uh since since then trying to identify some sites uh that that work for us uh one of those sites is the haynes creek site um it is uh downstream um just adjacent to the colorado canal uh, near the rocky ford area um it's a um it's a 5,000 acre foot site um, that uh, we can, uh, us, us as the four partners can utilize uh, to um, to recover our yield. So go ahead, Greg. Um, so it's just a little bit of the history, the 2004 IGA, um, uh, we're all also allowed to use whole book or reservoir. You'll see that in our storage uh, um, graphs. Uh, we looked at also alternatives uh, to, to the site. Um, we uh, have a decree for those exchanges from uh, the from the Roy storage back up uh, up above. Um, 2001, uh, we had an option agreement uh, for uh, for the Haynes Creek site, and we went ahead and executed that. So again, just uh, again more kind of on the timeline, just kind of looking at it a little bit different differently. Um, again, as, uh, looking at the Haynes Creek site, there's also the Stonewall Springs uh, site that we've been looking at. Uh, the, um, uh, the Haynes Creek site is, is, uh, was a little bit better. Uh, right now, the estimated capacity is about 5,000 acre feet uh, split amongst the partners. Um, our Rocky Ford office tells, tells me that uh, we, uh, Aurora needs about 10,000 acre feet um, in total um for uh for recovery yield uh, to maximize that um so what's kind of next um uh, and particularly with the haynes creek site uh, we've completed the 30 percent design uh we're going to be moving into more geotechnical studies there um just to understand what we can uh, what we can get out of that site uh, to maximize uh, maximize the storage um uh, we'll continue to look at the Stonewall Springs site um, and any other site that may uh, come come to us. Uh, moving on to the North Campus. Um, so as part of Prairie Waters in 2000, uh, 2003, uh, the city uh, filed on a couple of uh, storage, uh, former gravel pits uh, up in the uh, Lower South Platte uh, Reach uh, near Brighton, um, and we've continued to work on uh, the development of, of storage up there. So, uh, the Walker Complex, uh, Tucson South, um, uh, Prairie Waters came in uh, uh, in terms of the well field was developed up there. So, 
uh, we have augmentation needs uh, in the future uh, and those um, reservoir sites will be used to capture our reusable effluent um, and help us retime that again to to augment uh, the prairie waters project and the depletions associated with the well so adding more and more operational flexibility um, is is the purpose of uh, those sites up up north um so this just shows a list of the various uh um, gravel pits that we've that we have up there uh and they're low and they're listed from south to north so um the tucson south uh 3500 acre feet uh, that was um uh, started uh the agreements for those were started in 2003. um agri industries are minor up there they're going to be finishing that site in 2030. Uh, Challenger, Walker, Kirby, Dersham are all kind of part of the Walker complex. Um, we're working on um, looking at developing infrastructure for those sites. Uh, the next one up is the Everest site, uh, which is uh, closer to Fort Lupton. Uh, again, that's a phased project. Uh, we have three cells that are available to us right now, uh, about 2,500 acre feet in storage uh, that we can use. It's plumbed and piped and uh, we operate it uh, uh, taking water in and, and out to, to serve uh, uh, the Prairie Waters Project and other obligations we have. Um, there'll be some more uh, sites developed um, through 2034 as the mining continues down there. And then uh, kind of at the tail end of the system um, near uh, the town of Gilcrest, we have the Gilcrest site. Um, that uh, site is not, uh, we do not have a miner right now that uh, we acquired that site is to preserve some of uh, our exchanges that we have uh, that we played in the Prairie Waters case. Um, as as water moves down downstream, uh, we want to try to capture all of our return flows and be able to exchange those up. So uh, having that uh, potential facility down there will allow us to uh, to capture uh, more of our reusable return flows in exchange. So. Um, so the estimated capacity uh, right now uh, on the lower South Platte um, is around 25,000 acre feet once uh, once everything's been developed. Um, so in terms of the work plan, uh, the uh, a few years ago we did what was called the North Campus Master Plan, um, looking at uh, specifically what we need to to do to develop uh, the infrastructure there. Uh, we're going to go back into that plan and start to execute some of those things that we need to do uh, to get those facilities ready. Um, the Walker Reservoir Delivery, um, uh, the contracts with those are fairly complex in terms of how uh, we purchase those and uh, the entities that, that are supposed to deliver those with uh, uh, to us. Uh, we have some infrastructure issues with the slurry walls down there that we're working with uh, with um, the, the miners to resolve um, we're looking to start those that testing phase here in the next month or so um, to get walker ready to deliver to us um kind of uh, and behind that we're going to start looking at um the uh, uh, infrastructure and we're developing an rfp uh, to go out to uh, start the design for some of that infrastructure to connect those pits together look at uh plumbing and piping and pump stations, those kind of things to make those useful for us uh, moving forward. The Everest uh, site, again, is gonna be delivered to us in the 2030s. And so uh, we're, we're uh, gonna be looking at kind of some master planning efforts, getting ready for um, what we need to do in there in the future. So we have a plan uh, at the ready once uh, those, those sites become available to us. Um, those are our next steps there. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, offer for storage and recovery. Um, those uh, looking at uh, taking uh, water that we have, uh, putting it in the ground for storage um, and, and using it later. Uh, there are basically kind of three locations that we've been investigating over the last few years. Uh, Lost Creek is um, very much on the northeastern uh, side of, of town. Um, it's in a designated basin, so uh, it functions a little bit differently. Uh, in terms of the administration system, uh, but we've uh, we have done a preliminary investigation just to really understand the geology there, and how um, how water uh, moves into that basin and um, uh, and how it um, it gets recharged and, and the potential for recovery there. So, um, 
as you know, we're working on an integrated water master plan uh, and uh, Lost Creek's uh, part of that discussion and we're waiting for the results uh, to kind of help guide us on what to do next uh, in terms of Lost Creek. Uh, similar with the acre site, uh, so the Aurora Center for Renewable Energy, uh, which is located uh, a little closer to, uh, to, to town um, uh, within the Box Elder Basin. Um, we've done similar investigations looking at the soils there and the infiltration rates. Um, and we uh, were in the process of developing a pilot project. Uh, and again, we are holding uh, until IWMP is complete. Uh, but we are continuing some of the uh, water quality work uh, monitoring that's going on out there. Um, and then the last one is the Denver Basin uh, ASR. So that is the deep well uh, aquifers, uh, the confined aquifers that are below our feet uh, across the city. Um, uh, we've done some um, uh, investigations as part of the IWMP for, for the Denver Basin. Uh, looking to see where would be the best locations uh, for that from an operational standpoint. So, uh, and the thought is, is you know, trying to site some of this near existing infrastructure, uh, so it's easier to move water around. So, uh, again, more modeling is probably needed to see how those those fit into the system. And last but not least, uh, East Reservoir. So uh, this is something we've been working on since uh, the development of Prairie Waters. Uh, we, uh, in the uh, Prairie Waters uh, decrees, we pled uh, several sites uh, for terminal storage uh, closer to, to Aurora as uh, basically at the end of the Prairie Water system. Um, and we've worked on those uh, throughout the years. Um, as part of the IDMMP process, we've identified that we still have the need for 10 to 25,000 acre feet uh, of storage uh, to basically give us more operational flexibility for prairie waters um, as as the city continues to to um, to grow and and uh, the, the need for additional uh, storage is is going to increase uh, to uh, maximize prairie waters and so. Uh, right now we're starting to look back at uh, some of those reservoir sites that were pledged to in particular. Um, on the northeastern side uh, of town off of uh, Jewel Avenue. So um, we're going to be looking at what's what's out there currently uh, the, the in terms of land uses, uh, again, natural resources. So, you know, what kinds of um, uh, plants are out there, what kinds of uh, wildlife may be out there that we may have to consider. And then, you know, again, just getting down to the geology, um, what can be supported out there in terms of of, uh, of a reservoir. So that concludes uh, the presentation. I know that was a lot to take in. Uh, this is a rendition of uh, what a wild horse may look like, uh, looking on the, the eastern side of the site back to back to the west and the main dam there in the canyon. Thanks, Rich. That's a lot of great information that we could dedicate an entire meeting to. <laughs> I have a lot of questions, but uh, Francoise, Councilmember Bergen or Coons, any questions? Uh, yes. A couple. On the East Reservoir, um, you will be taking in consideration any um, any oil and gas operations, I would assume. <laughs> yes, we will. Uh, yeah, we will look at uh, oil and gas operations out there uh, again as part of that land investigation, those current uses. Okay, um, and then my second question real quick was on back to the. Um, the wild horse on the permitting um, with the BLM. Um, is there anything um, that council should be doing in terms of lobbying at the at the uh, you know at our congressional level um, to help with that process, or do you guys do that? Um, yeah, I think I'll let Marshall uh, maybe take that question because he's more engaged on um, that that side. I can jump in as well. I was just going to say uh, we are working really well with the BLM right now. And so I am not sure that we want to uh, stir that pot. They've been very supportive <laughs> and they are focused. Okay, yeah, I guess my concern was if there were any obstacles um, that that our congressman could help us with, but it doesn't sound like it. Well, it's a great thing to 
in mind. I'm sorry, Marshall, go ahead. No, I was going to say it's a really good question and we've had that conversation internally a couple of times now. Um, <clears throat> we're making enough positive progress that we think it could actually have a negative impact if we if we pull the trigger now, but it is an option that we've identified and we're kind of keeping it out there, trying to BLM moves slow. If we think we slow. move slow, they move really slow. Um, <clears throat> so we're trying to view it as a cup half full and they are making progress. Some of it very recently has been, as Alex pointed out, very positive. So right now, not not uh, thinking that would make well, sense. Well, and the fact that we're funding the staff to work on the project, I mean, it's kind of, I'm like, why are they so slow when we're paying? I know. To, to do their work, kind of. And then we're going to be hiring the third party consultant. Yep. It seems like they don't have anything to do. So stay out of our way. <laughs> Uh, what I will say, Francois, from a staff perspective, uh, the project manager that they've assigned uh, to us um, is a is a is a strong project manager. He's uh, has several um, NEPA projects under his belt, and so uh, the engagement we've had with him has been very good this last year. Um, we've got regular meetings with them now, uh, and so uh, we are um, we are seeing a lot more progress with them within this last year. Uh, you know, and, and having the MOU uh, outlining roles and responsibilities has been very helpful because uh, we we kind of know where uh, each of us stand and what we're responsible for. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Coombs, uh, questions? Uh, no, that was very thorough. Thank you. Very thorough. Thank you, Rich. A lot of great information. So uh, there are two conceivable future reservoirs east and what else sort of set aside for well and there there were originally uh five or six locations identified um mm -hmm. and we've kind of narrowed it down to what we think are two of the two most feasible sites that meet our needs right now um so there will be some, we'll have to ramp up some discussions. You, you notice in that slide, there were discussions with property owners. You'll end up based on our, our planning. We were hopeful for, for ASR, Rich talked about the ASR stuff. With the PFAS regulations, um, that really kind of dampened our hopes for ASR and is shifting priorities over to surface storage on the east side. So the Box Creek, while, while we've got activities ongoing out there, um, we're having to prioritize the storage buckets on the eastern side ahead of Box Creek, ahead of ASR. Um, what that does is allows us to take advantage of our reuse water coming off of the South Platte train. So the radial wells that we're moving forward with right now and the volumes of water will be able to get out of the South Platte in order to maximize the use of that reusable water in our system. Year round, we have to add storage. And so that's where we were hoping it would be ASR. That doesn't look as hopeful anymore. And so we're looking at surface. Okay. Thanks, we will only choose one of the two. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Lots of science there. Thank you. So to honor uh, Catherine and Kevin's time here, moving on to number six, direct potable reuse project presentation. All right. Sorry. Can you guys see me at least? <laughs> A little slow here. Let me see here. Here we go. Yeah, we see you. All right. Hopefully everybody could see that. Um, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come and, and talk to you today. Catherine and I are here to discuss with you a very important project for Aurora Water and the city of Aurora, uh, not only in the near term, but what we believe uh, for the future as well. So Catherine Schumacher, uh, project engineer two with Aurora Water is here with me this morning. 
Um, I'm Kevin Linder. I'm the Advanced Water Treatment Superintendent for Aurora Water. And we're here to talk to you about a strategy for implementation of direct potable reuse. Um, we'll refer to it as DPR in the presentation. Um, we believe it's an important resource or it can be an important source for us now in the near term as well as the future. There are several advantages we believe for this approach and this uh, project. Two of which we've talked about a lot this morning. One, it's independent of snowpack and it's independent of river stage. So it's always available to us. We also feel that this approach and development of this source is, is very sustainable as well as resource protective. So I'm gonna walk through a few slides with us um, covering kind of a why, why we believe it's important and, and um, what Aurora Water has been doing for over the last decade to put our ourselves in a really good position to be successful at this project. And Catherine's going to then tell us about um, our task force that we've developed and kind of how that will help us accomplish these goals. For me, I'd like to keep this informal. If you have questions, you know, you don't have to wait till the end. I know we're getting close to lunchtime, but feel free to just just uh, ask away. Um, so. I'm going to I'm going to start with a few slides on why it's important and um, then I'll hand it over to Catherine. So, why is why is DPR important for Aurora water? Well, number 1, something we've talked about a lot this morning is the reality is we live in a high plains desert, right? We, we don't have a lot of water. Um, it seems like droughts been around for many, many years, and I don't think it's going anywhere. Water scarcity is something we have to live with and learn to deal with. Um, the other part of that is um, we have the water rights. As, as many, everybody knows, we have water rights that R Richard ref talked about that allow us to use water we bring across the continental divide to extinction. So DPR will help us utilize those water rights to um, their fullest extent, or, or at least a greater extent than we are right now. And um, with the growth that the city's experiencing, um, we feel like this is a really viable um, approach for us to be able to provide high quality drinking water um, using a lot of the things we already have in place. The other thing that makes this um, a very feasible project for us is there's there's been a lot of technological advances over the lot over the last decade that allow us to treat highly impaired water sources. Um, you know, we did the prairie water system over a decade ago, and we started using a lot of those advanced water treatment technologies to treat that impaired water source. And, you know, so we have some good practice, if you will, at, at advanced treatment. So we feel like that's in our favor as well. The other part that, that helps us is we have a better understanding of the fate and transport of a lot of the contaminants that maybe maybe we didn't understand, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And so that what what that allows us to do is to be able to control our sewer shed a little bit, possibly. Um, a big part of the the DPR project will be um, developing uh, enhanced source control program that will um, you know help us to understand where we need to maybe do some work out in the out in our sewer shed to make sure we have a good consistent source water. Um, and then I just wanted to underline again, we've been doing potable reuse for over over 10 years. And so we feel like we have learned a lot and we're in a good position to do um, DPR. So just as a little review, I know everybody's familiar with this, but I wanted to just talk about this a little bit. So this is this was the prairie water system. Um, this is where we started at. Remember, we have the South Platte River that has um, down, it's downstream of the metro area. We have 23 alluvial wells along it, and we've been very successful at treating that to a, you know, one of the main goals from when we started the prairie water system was we wanted to make sure that that water from a very impaired source was indistinguishable from the water from our mountain source. And I think we've been very successful for that. So just as a reminder, this is kind of how this all started up here. Um, we're bringing water through the through the riverbank into our wells, and then we bring it down to Benny, and we treat it through some advanced 
advanced uh, water treatment technologies. And so um, the biggest difference that I wanted to point out between what we're proposing with direct potable reuse and what we're doing already with indirect potable reuse is just this river, what they, what they refer to as an environmental buffer. So what we're proposing is we're gonna remove that environmental buffer and take highly treated wastewater from Sand Creek and put it into this Prairie Waters line and be able to use that source and bring it back to Benny. You know, we have to we have to go through a process of of defining some possibly additional treatment processes, but we feel that this is very doable for us. Um, and the, again, the multiple barrier approach is something that we've had success with with, and we will continue to um, implement for for this project. Um, at Benny, we use uh, softening, uh, advanced oxidation with hydrogen peroxide and and high levels of UV light. Um, then we have some biological filters as well as some adsorb adsorbers. And so we feel like we have a lot of these, these um, processes in place. We're very good at using a lot of them and they will be required as part of the, the DPR um, approach moving forward. Um, so, like I mentioned, we were, Marshall asked us to develop a task force to to develop this, to look at it, to to really dig in and try to move forward with making DPR a reality. So we, we wanted to define what our purpose and kind of our mission and value was so we know where we're going. And so our purpose is to develop, to, to develop a strategy for implementation for DPR at Aurora Water. And we feel like overall, our vision is to continue leading the industry in the protection of public health never compromising public health through development of innovative, sustainable water purification using DPRs, DP, DPR to maximize existing source water supplies. We feel that's really key and is really important. And, and as a, underneath that umbrella of vision is our mission to accomplish that. And we want to provide high quality drinking water through implementation of DPR using advanced purification technologies for reusable water supplies to meet all regulatory requirements and future drinking water demands. And many of you probably um, know that in the last couple of months, the Department of Health has finalized or, or at least promulgated uh, the DPR regulation into the drinking water regulations. So the way we, we believe we wanna um, accomplish this mission and vision is we develop some goals, um, one of which is to execute those policies that the Department of Health have, have just put out um, we think that that that's possible. Um, our goal is to have eight to ten MGD of DPR to our customers on or before 2030. So um, you know that's not a hard deadline. We believe that you know we maybe could do it earlier, maybe a little bit later, but our goal is 2030, and that's right in alignment with the Integrated Water Master Plan two uh, findings as well. So we feel that that that's a good goal for us. We want to also enlist a consultant to assist in defining our optimal DPR implementation scheme, and we need um, their support in development of the DPR application to the Department of Health. And just to, uh, to uh, underline that that DPR application isn't something that can be done in a day or two or a weekend. It's actually a multi-year effort that requires lots of piloting, lots of testing. We want to make sure that that as we go down this road, that we're always protective of public health and putting water quality as our top priority. And so there's gonna be a lot of testing to make sure we accomplish that because that's always our, our number one priority. Um, we want to involve essential stakeholders such as yourself in the development of DPR as we go down this road. And now um, I'm gonna hand it over to Catherine to tell you a little bit about how the task force is structured and will function. Okay. I'm sorry, I have a noon. I feel so bad. Ah. Um, so I'm going to try to get this through with this, but I don't want to rush either. So um, I might have Kevin jump back on if we didn't, if we don't get through all the slides. But um, this is our structure. Um, it's a kind of a, a hierarchy here with an executive board um, at the top, which will help direct and provide executive oversight of the task force. 
as well as help us provide um, and allocate resources and support to get the work done um, and be accountable for enabling success. Um, right now, we have identified the executive board as Marshall, Sarah, and Todd um, as kind of our, our three executive board members. Then below that, we have the chairs, which is myself and Kevin. Um, I'm kind of in the construction management engineering side, and Kevin's the operations treatment chair. And so believe between the two of us, we hope we have um, the high level uh, requirements kind of um, overseen. The we will be responsible for the overall coordination and performance and completion of the mission and objectives that Kevin has gone through. We're also going to help um, balance competing resources and uh, allocate resources, as well as liaison between the various other levels of the organization chart. Then below that, we have our steering committee. Um, there's various colors you see on the slide here. Um, the colors represent the different sections of the DPR application. So you can see environmental compliance actually has three elements to it, enhanced source control, regulations, and lab work. Um, and so we have the steering committee kind of at that higher level to direct and help these work groups, which are going to be below them, carry out the work. And they're going to steer the work groups, um, help them achieve goals, again, to meet our mission and purpose and objectives. They're also going to help provide input and direction to the um, uh, uh, the chairs and then the executive board. So it's kind of roll up and down. And then the, um, I wanna say the lowest level, because they're not lowest, they're just our workhorses here. They're gonna be the various work groups, which are gonna be the workhorses to get the different elements of the application together. And they're divided again into the different elements of the application. So treatment ops and piloting will be under the treatment ops steering committee. and um, they'll kind of be working with the consultant and internally to use as many resources as we can internally to get the application and all the, the items together for submittal to CDPAG. Um, and then um, I think the next slide, if you can go to the next slide. Okay, so path forward here, we are meeting with the steering committee members to walk through the DPR application framework and recruit um, our internal resources as, as we have available to us. We have actually already developed the charter. The charter um, is our overall roadmap of what we want to accomplish. So high level risks, high level requirements, high level goals, um, identifies key stakeholders, identifies roles and responsibilities. Then um, we're going to delve down even further and identify um, project requirements from that level. And then what else? We're going to evaluate the application tasks and we've done a lot of work already and have completed a lot of tasks in deciding if Aurora wanted to do this and pursue this endeavor. So there's a lot of homework we've already completed and assignments we've already completed. We're going to pull all that together and leverage that as we move forward. We're also going to establish our and define our work groups for the application and the various scopes of work for those guys and girls. Um, we're also going to develop a scope schedule and budget for 2023. Like, what can we actually get done this year? And then plan long term scope, schedule, and budget and strategy to get us to the finish line, the ultimate finish line of 2030. So, well, since we're just kicking this off this year, we want to understand what we can get done this year and how to plan for the next few years. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, we're also going to, as uh, Kevin mentioned, develop an, a request for proposal to select a consultant to help us with all this. Um, and that's to support a project T33 that was identified in the IWMP2 as a DPR project. We're going to complete our risk analysis and some plan some risk responses. Uh, we're going to develop a communications plan. There's a lot of communication that has to happen for this endeavor, whether that's internal and external stakeholders. Um, and a big one is going to be CDPHG and regular interactions with them. Then we're also going to communicate regularly with the um, executive board. I think we have um, a 15 minute spot with the Monday morning monthly meetings with the executive board to provide them updates. And we're just going to have to ebb and flow. This is new territory. This is something no one else has done before. There are a couple of utilities that are pursuing this, but there's going to be course changes. There's going to be um, redirections and we just have to remain flexible and nimble and, older and able to do that. And we're going to monitor and control the project. Um, I'm going to be putting in all my 
project management skills to the test here and help manage, monitor and control this project as we normally do with capital projects. And then last and finally, we're going to assemble our application um, package and um, I guess we should be begin public outreach first and then the application package because there's a whole almost three year in advance public outreach um, a mountain to climb in order to get the, the right messaging out to everyone and all the stakeholders. So public outreach and get our application together. So I'm just going to say bye. I'm sorry. I have to go, mm -hmm. <laughs> but nice seeing everyone and Kevin will handle any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Any questions, council members? Go ahead, uh, council member Bergen. Yes. Hey, I have to apologize because I did have to multitask with a couple um, kind of important emails. So maybe I just wasn't listening correctly. Um, so this this differs because from the prairie waters that we currently have system, because currently we're getting our water from the South Platte and we're ha and it's not necessarily the cleanest water. So we're going to look at the Sand Creek River. Did I get that right? So or no. <laughs> Go ahead, Marshall. Yeah, and Kevin and Kevin may have to correct some of what I say. I'm going to oversimplify a little bit, but we are right now. Our reusable water is going up to basically Metro Water Recovery, our partnership there. It's being treated and discharged into the South Platte River. We do scalp some of that water at Sand Creek, not the river, but the Sand Creek facility. We treat it and we use it for irrigation purposes within, like here at the AMC, a couple of golf courses and city parks. The opportunity we have here, so the technology exists, as, as you heard from Kevin and Catherine, mostly Kevin, the technology exists to clean up that reuse water essentially directly from the Sand Creek facility instead of routing it up to Metro. So there's an opportunity to create significant cost effective efficiencies in our system if we take the Sand Creek water, for example, directly to Binney instead of routing it up to Metro's treatment facilities, discharging it into the river, pulling it back out of the river, and then bring it down. In addition to the uh, cost savings that could be achieved. There are also some, believe it or not, water quality benefits. When the water discharges from Metro into the South Platte River, it, it has other water quality, basically some salts and some other compounds as well that end up in it that we then have to deal with on the back end. So in some ways, not always, but in some ways, the water coming out of the back end of Sand Creek is cleaner in some ways than the water we would recover out of the South Platte. So those are the, the drivers where this is a fantastic opportunity. The regulatory framework or environment in Colorado has shifted and in the nation has shifted now to allow us to start looking at things like this. Um, but we are out on the leading edge again when we're looking at this kind of stuff. So. Kevin, did I misstate anything? No, I think you I think you did good, Marshall. Okay. That's a good Thanks. explanation. Any other questions? Thank you both. Oh, sorry. I, oh, yes. mm -hmm. I do have some questions. Sorry. Please go ahead. Um, so you said there's cost savings, presumably from the cost of transporting the water, pumping it, all the electricity costs, et cetera. Um, but I know we've also been having an increase of costs for kind of the chemicals and other aspects of the treatment process. So if we're doing a higher volume of water through that treatment process, is that going to involve increased costs on that side? And then do we just think those will still be offset by this, by doing this instead? A good question, and Kevin can definitely answer in more detail than me, but very good point. Some of our costs for treatment will go up for chemicals, electricity, things like that at Binney. Other costs would at Metro's facilities would be avoided. So the big picture, it would be 
cost savings, but we will see individual cost centers or, or chemical costs or power costs shifted to our own facilities away from Metro's facilities. And one thing we're having to do in order to go down this path is to negotiate with Metro. Our, our Metro agreement right now is not necessarily positioned to support this kind of a, a project. So um, we are having to renegotiate that to ensure that we're not being double charged for some costs. I will also point out there are times of the year right now where we double pay for some of the treatment costs because we pay at Sand Creek and then we have to turn around and pay at Metro as well. So we eliminate that redundancy in treatment costs and narrow it down to one. So all things considered, um, it's a cost effective direction to go, but it does shift costs around differently. Further questions? No, oh, that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin, for that, that presentation. Thank you. A lot of great work. Important project. Thank you. Uh, miscellaneous matters of consideration. I have none. Marshall, anything? Any, anyone else? No, I, I will just thank Kevin and and uh, I think I did it with Rich also for letting me weigh in on their presentations. They did a fantastic job. And, and our staff here in Aurora Water, uh, the expertise uh, that the staff have is just amazing to make these projects happen and, and things work. We are a young water utility and being so young um, is good and bad. It requires that we think outside the box, which is good and bad. But again, the staff, the staff in Aurora Water is is amazing in being able to to prepare us for the future. Yes, they are. They they make you look good, sir. They do. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your patience, everyone. I'm just going over a few minutes and confirming our next meeting will be April 19th. And have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.